Kelly with National History Academy. Today is the third of our live stream tours. Uh, next week, we will be visiting the Oklahoma City National M Museum and Memorial, uh, four o'clock on Wednesday. Today, we are gonna be visiting a really interesting site. We've got Dr. Brent Glass, the Director Emeritus of the National Museum of, or the Smithsonian National Museum of American History to introduce the site. Good afternoon, thanks for the introduction, Michelle, and uh, I'm really delighted to uh, welcome you to this uh, tour of the National Museum of Industrial History. It's one of my all-time favorite museums for many reasons, which I can discuss uh, at great length in an another program, but I don't want to take away from the, uh, the, the great uh, tour that you're about to have, the, the National Museum of Industrial History in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Um, has a unique mission to forge a connection between America's industrial past and the innovations of today by educating the public and inspiring the visionaries of tomorrow. And I'm, I'm sure you will be inspired by this tour and it's very, uh, gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce Emily Marcello, who is the collections manager at the uh, National Museum of Industrial History. So I'm going to share my screen and we're going to drop into our 3D scan of the museum here. Um, so this is the lobby of the museum. We are located on the former site of the Bethlehem Steel Corporation's Bethlehem plant. And this is the electrical repair shop building, which was constructed in 1913. Um, if you look overhead, we still have some of the original components to the building. Um, this is the overhead crane, which would have been used to transport motors and large electrical components throughout the building. And then there is still a second, uh, a second crane up on our second floor, which would have lifted pieces up through a hole in the floor, well, the ceiling from the side, um, uh, to repair smaller motors upstairs. And so many of the buildings um, still remain on this site from the original Bethlehem plant. You can see some of them out our window here. Across the street from us is our sister building, which was the carpenter and pattern shop. And then off in the distance there is the faint outline of Bethlehem's iconic blast furnaces. So this first piece that we have here in the lobby is the Frick Eclipse portable steam engine. Um, and we start here um, with this piece showing the transition of America from an agrarian farming society to one that is industrialized and um, using more machinery. So to the left of the Frick clips, you see this small section of bushel baskets here. And this shows what one man could do um, harvesting wheat at the end of the day um, using just his hands and a flail. And then to the right of the Frick, you see this much larger pile of bushel baskets. And this shows the difference in the amount of harvest that one man could do with the aid of this machine. Um, and the Frick is, was really revolutionary for its time because it allowed power to be portable. Um, you could move this into your field and you could hook different machines up to it um, and use it for harvest or in the case of this mural that we have in the lobby, um, they are harvesting lumber, used at a lumber yard. Um, so as we make our way through the galleries, we'll take a look at some of the other innovations that change the way that we live and work in America today. So we'll make our way back to the main exhibit galleries. Um, to the left there is our changing exhibit space. And then to the right is our education center. And then we make our way to the first gallery in the museum. So this gallery is called Machinery Hall. And in this space, um, we talk about the 1876 Centennial Exposition. Um, in 1876, the United States was celebrating 100 years of American independence. Um, it had been 100 years since the Declaration of Independence had been signed in Philadelphia. 
So as that celebration, the country decided to hold the first official World's Fair on U.S. soil. Um, it took place in Philadelphia. There were over uh, 300 buildings, thousands of exhibitors, and 27 countries um, present, represented in this celebration. Um, and one of the main buildings at the Centennial was Machinery Hall. And within Machinery Hall, there were all sorts of trade show displays um, showing off new inventions and innovations that were sweeping the nation. Um, it's at the Centennial that we see the, the sewing machine and the telephone. Um, and so within the center of Machinery Hall, we, there was a large coreless engine. This is a model of the actual engine that was there. Um, the inventor, George Corliss, would take this model around with him to potential buyers to show off his invention. Um, but just behind here, you can see, just for scale of how big this engine actually was, um, there's a little person right here um, compared to the large machine. And May 10th, 1876, the Centennial opened its doors with this grand celebration, um, and President Grant led the opening ceremonies and then led a procession back into Machinery Hall. And he, along with the Emperor of Brazil, Dom Pedro, flipped a switch and turned on the great Corliss engine, um, which powered all of the machines within the building. Um, and it was said that it was such a spectacle that um, the poet Walt Whitman actually stood speechless in front of the machine for like 30 minutes, um, just amazed. After the Centennial closed, the engine was sold and was used, I believe, to manufacture um, rail cars. And then after that, it was sold for scrap. Um, so it no longer exists, unfortunately, but Corliss engines are still um, surviving today. This is our Corliss engine. It was built in 1914 and was used in York, Pennsylvania to pump water into a reservoir. Um, and it provided water to the people of York until like the 1980s. And then afterwards, um, it aged and rusted. And then eventually it was donated to the museum where our historian and a team of volunteers meticulously restored it um, into working condition. And so if you ever have a chance to visit us, you should come by on a day when we're doing um, a Corliss demonstration because it is really, um, something to see. It's, it's the gem of the museum, I think. Um, such a beautiful piece. And you'd be surprised at how quiet it is when it runs. <laughs> so now I'm going to take you over here to one of my favorite pieces in the museum. It might not look as impressive as the Corliss, but I love this piece. It's called the Nicholson File Display. Um, and it was actually on display at the Centennial. Many of the pieces that you see in the museum here are from the same time period, late 19th century pieces, and they, some of them have been restored to look beautiful and shiny and new, like they would have been on display at the Centennial. But this piece actually was there. Um, and uh, while files may not seem like the most interesting thing, this was a trade show and people were trying to attract your attention and to sell their wares. And so one of the ways that they did that was to create these beautiful elaborate displays. Um, and if you see photos of the Centennial from back then, there are other displays that are very similar. I've seen them with like wrenches and I saw a beautiful display using different knives. Um, so it, it's, it's really neat to see um, what they did to try and draw people's attention to their specific setups. And then to the left of me here is um, some small woodworking equipment. And this would have been marketed to um, woodworkers with smaller shops. Um, and these are unique because they are pedal powered. Um, so you, the user would sit on this little bench here and then below that under the machine, it's blocked by this sign, but um, oh, there we go. There are little pedals and it would uh, turn the leather belt, which would then turn um, the piece that the, the woodworker was working on. And these machines changed the way that 
people worked because it allowed them to be a lot more productive. Um, before this time, they were doing a lot of this work by hand, um, and it took a lot more time and energy to do that. Um, so these small machines changed the way that craftsmen work too. So we're gonna go over here and I'll try not to make you dizzy. <laughs> um, this I think is one of the most beautiful pieces in the museum. This is the Lindy Wolf ammonia compressor. Um, it's actually an early form of refrigeration and it was used by a brewery in Baltimore actually. Um, I just love that piece. And then as we go over here, I just wanna point out this little green machine over here is another piece that was on display at the Centennial. Just have to point those out. Now I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about line shafting. Um, line shafting is this black metal frame that you see to the left of us. Oops. So, over here, we have this whole line of machinery. And in order to power the machinery, we need a steam engine. And so I have one steam engine and um, lots of machinery here. So how do I get the power from here all the way down to the end of the row? Well, we use line shafting. So the steam engine is powered by a boiler. We have a model of one right here. Coal is burned in the boiler, which then heats up water and then water evaporates to form steam, like you would get from a, a tea kettle. And then the steam comes out of the boiler and creates pressure, and the pressure of the steam is what drives the steam engine and gives it its motion. Then a leather belt would have been connected to this smaller wheel on the steam engine up to the line shafting. And the line shafting has something that was called a drive shaft, and it would go the whole length of this line shafting. And there are these small wheels that you can see up here that go all the way down. And the wheels are connected to leather belts and the leather belts are then connected to the machines. And um, that is how the machines further down will get their power. And so you could either engage your machine by um, having the belt hooked on or you could disengage the machine and have it so that it wasn't operating. And so this way you could power a full line of machinery with just one steam engine on the end here. And so then remember how I said that the Coralis engine powered all of the machines in Machinery Hall? Well, it did it through line shafting. Um, it was different than how this looked. The Coralis engine in Machinery Hall was connected to line shafting that went underneath the floor and so the belts would come up from the floorboards and then loop onto the machines rather than going over the machines and then coming down. And so now we're gonna make our way to the next gallery in the museum, which is our iron and steel gallery. And so the museum is located on the former Bethlehem plant site. Um, and the plant site at one point stretched five miles along the Lehigh River, and the Lehigh River um, goes through the heart of Bethlehem. And so um, the steel making process is a huge process that um, took many different structures and networks of transportation to get that final product of steel. Um, so since it is such a large span to talk about, we use these models um, to show our visitors the processes that took place here. And these models were actually used by the company to train new employees who were working in the different departments um, on the processes that took place there. So this first model is um, a model of the Coke ovens. And the Coke ovens is where we get our fuel source to create iron, um, because you need something that burns really hot to get the iron. So coke is made from coal and coal is loaded into the ovens and then all the oxygen is removed from the ovens and then the coke is heated to a very high temperature to remove the impurities. And the oxygen is removed from the furnace so that the coal doesn't ignite because you don't want it burning up before you get to use it. Um, and so once the coke is done baking, it's then dumped out the side here 
into train cars below, and as it's dumped out, it's hitting the oxygen in the air. So to keep it from igniting, it's sprayed down with water. And so then once we have our coke, we go to the next step, which is producing iron. Iron is produced in the blast furnaces and on the Bethlehem site, we still have, I think six of the blast furnaces remaining. This is a model of blast furnace B, which is still out there. Um, and so the coke would be loaded into the blast furnace along with limestone and iron ore. And they would be heated and the impurities would be removed from the iron ore giving us iron. And at the end of the process, we would have two products. We would have, um, we would have, oops, knew something like that was gonna happen. <laughs> we would have steel and then we, I mean, we'd have iron and then we would have slag. And so slag is the waste product we get from the steel process. I'm sorry, there we go. I need to get back up on my ramp. <laughs> so slag is the waste product that is all the impurities that were removed from the, um, the iron. And then the molten iron is then loaded into special cars called submarine cars, um, which are like tubular shaped, kind of like a submarine. And then it would be taken over to be made into steel at our open hearth furnace. So at the open hearth furnace, we take the iron and then also coke, which is high in carbon to make steel. Um, and the, um, at the end of that process, when the, the iron and the coke are baked together, we get the steel. Now the, um, the open hearth furnaces were replaced by basic oxygen furnaces in the 1950s. Um, because the basic oxygen furnaces found a better way to heat up the furnace in a more efficient way to use that energy. Um, so over time, innovations in steel making led to changes in some of these processes. And so open hearths are no longer used today. And so once we have steel, now we need to do something with it. So we have three different ways that we transform steel into a finished product through rolling, casting, and forging. So rolling is when you take the steel and you press it through two rolls, kind of like two rolling pins, but on a massive scale, and you press it into these long shapes. So this process is used if you need something like wire or a long steel beam. And then the other process is casting, which is used to make complex steel shapes. So this is when molten steel is poured into a mold and you get shapes like these gears, or if you need like a specialized tool that's a certain shape, you can cast it. And then forging, which is used to create strong steel products. Forging is when you hammer something into a specific shape. And the benefit of forging is it gives you a really strong product. I'm going to spin us around here slowly so you don't get motion sick. <laughs> so behind us is this beautiful steam hammer. And this is what we would use to forge something like what I just showed you on the wall behind me. Um, down below here is this piece would go up and down and your piece of steel would be at the base here to give you a better view without flying all over the place. Um, this is where your steel would be and it would be hammered down into place. And when we go down there, I'll show you a different view. Um, and depending on what shape of steel you wanted, you could interchange this part right here. You can see how it looks like it can come out. There are other shapes that you can place in there depending on what you're making. So now we'll make our way down the ramp here. And in this section of the gallery, we talk a bit about steel's influence on transportation. Um, one of the main products that Bethlehem Steel manufactured was steel rail. Um, 
and this little display here, try to get a little closer for you, shows the evolution of rail over time. The top piece here is actually a piece of iron rail, and iron was known for being brittle and would wear down relatively easily. Um, if you imagine a brittle piece of metal and then trains thundering over that piece of metal, then over time it would cause cracks and breaks in the surface. And eventually that piece of metal would break and could cause um, trains to derail and would end in some pretty serious accidents. Um, so with the invention of steel, we now have stronger rails that don't have to be replaced as often and can withstand more use over time. And then this bottom piece is also a steel rail, um, a newer piece of steel rail. So we see that progression of rail over time. And then over here, we just talk a bit about how steel is not only used for transportation with trains, but also used in the manufacture of airplanes. Um, steel was super important for building ships, especially during World War II. Bethlehem Steel was a major shipbuilder. And then also in the use of land travel with cars and the structures used for traveling by cars, such as bridges and tunnels. We'll make our way down the ramp and take a look at our skyscrapers. Um, so here we have some sections of different type of steel beams. And over time, there were innovations in how these beams were made and shaped. To the left, you see this girder style beam and behind it is an example of the type of building it was used in. And then if you notice, as we get further and further to the right side, the buildings are getting taller, but also it looks like we're using less steel in our beams until we get all the way to the right side of this beam where we have our tallest structure. So innovations in rolling the steel also allowed us to create taller structures. And it's said that about 80% of New York City's skyline can be attributed to steel manufactured by Bethlehem Steel. So this is a model of the universal mill, sometimes called the Gray Mill, which was invented by Henry Gray. And he came up with a way that we could process steel in such a way that we had wide flange beams. Now flanges are the sides of the beams on the top and the bottom you see here. And so the wider the flange you have, the stronger the piece of steel, which means the taller the building that you can make. Um, and so it's really Henry Gray's innovation in rolling technology allowed us to have our taller buildings, that and the, the innovation of the elevator, really. We'll take a look over here, get a different view of our steam hammer. These are some more examples of some forged pieces of metal and then right here, you can see this is a different um, shape of the head that can be inserted into this place right here, depending on what sort of shape you want to hammer into your steel. You can see this machine is massive. It goes all the way to the ceiling of the museum. And this one is actually also an early one from the late 19th century. Now let's go and let's talk a little bit about the Bethlehem steel workers who were really the heart of the steel making operation. Um, so as you can imagine, working with hot and molten steel and large machinery could be very dangerous. Um, in the museum, we have this chart that shows the number of accidents, injuries, and deaths caused at the steel plant over time. And then in 1912, a safety movement swept the country. And that's when Bethlehem Steel really changed the way that um, they provided safety equipment and uh, safety regulations to their workers to help protect them. Up here, we have this poster, which shows an example of um, some of the safety requirements for the steel workers hard hats in case you are working and something falls from higher up, you don't get a head injury. 
earplugs because working with the loud machinery can cause hearing loss. Safety glasses were required because if you're working with a molten metal and it splashes, you could get hit in the face. Um, also, if you're working with like shaving down bits of metal, you don't want metal flakes in your eyes. And then gloves to protect your hands. And then metatarsal safety shoes are these shoes that have a steel covering over the toe so that if you drop something really heavy, like a large wrench or something, you wouldn't break your foot. And then something that I find really interesting about the Bethlehem plant, and it's probably pretty common for other industrial jobs as well, is that the hard hats, the colors of the hard hats had different meanings. So if you were a visitor to the Bethlehem plant, you would wear a white hard hat. If you were a manager of the plant, you wore a green hard hat, and they were also called cabbage heads. Um, if you were a, an hourly employee, then you would wear a yellow hard hat, and they were also called lemon heads. And then certain departments wore these special red hats. Um, the erection department, those who worked in like building skyscrapers, um, they were one of the departments that wore the red hard hats. And then, one of the really cool artifacts we have on display here is actually this first aid kit. I can't get super close, but when this was donated to us, it came in with all of the original contents still intact. Um, none of the, the wrappings had been opened, so each of these little tiny boxes within the first aid kit still has the plastic wrapper on it, which I think is so cool. Um, and these would have been throughout the plant for easy access um, if the workers had an emergency or an accident. Um, there are things like, as, such as band-aids in there, but there's also gauze. Um, if someone passed out, there's ammonia inhalants. Um, and then there's some triage stuff too. So if you had um, more of a major injury, then there, there were some emergency supplies in there as well. So then up here we have this little sign that says three blasts for first aid men. Um, one of the ways that the workers in the Bethlehem plant communicated was through whistles because working in the plant was really loud and there are, you're trying to talk to each other over machinery, over other men working. And so one of the ways that it was easy for people to get each other, other's attention was using whistles. And depending on the number or length of whistle blasts, it signaled different things to workers. So if you had a first aid emergency and you needed the first aid crew to come, then three whistle blasts and they would come running. So then over here, we have this interesting looking wire rack system. And this is actually a type of locker system that they used at Bethlehem Steel. It's called a welfare rack. Welfare rooms were these rooms, kind of like a locker room, where workers would get ready at the beginning of their shift and change into all of their work clothes. And then you would store your personal belongings in one of these baskets up above. The way it works is each one of these little tubes has a chain in it. And so you could lower your basket down, put your things in it, hoist your basket back up and then clip a lock on it so that no one could access your things. And many workers had two baskets actually, one at one end of the welfare room and one at the other end of the welfare room. And one was for their clean clothes. So when they were ready to go home for the day, they could change out of their dirty clothes and then put them on the dirty welfare basket side of the room and then keep their clean stuff on the clean side of the room. And um, one of the interesting things about the welfare rooms and the welfare racks is that in 1941, that was the, one of the first victories that the steelworkers unions um, got, was these um, baskets and this place for the workers to keep their things. Now we're going to look over here and we have this section on um, Bethlehem Steel and the war effort. We especially highlight Bethlehem Steel's efforts during World War II. Um, they were a large producer of battleships, not necessarily put all together at the Bethlehem plant, but the Bethlehem plant produced some of the sheet and the plates used for these ships. Um, and it was said that Eugene Grace, who was the president of the company, 
promised the government a ship a day through World War II, and by the end of the war, they actually exceeded that number. And this graphic on the wall is a representation of the ships that they made. And then to the left here, we actually have some of a display that was in the main office building of Bethlehem Steel. Um, and there's little models of some of the ships here. Let me zoom in. Um, so there was this beautiful display in the main office building of all the ships showing off what they had done for the war effort. Really impressive. And then in front of me here, there is this um, steel plate from a ship with a shell in it. And this was actually from uh, testing out some plate. So not from an actual battleship, but testing the strength of the plate. And then behind us here is this display that talks about women in the war effort. Um, before World War II, you didn't see women working these um, manual labor positions in the Bethlehem steel plant. Um, they might be doing like office positions, answering phones, secretarial work, but you didn't see them down on the floor making steel. And so then in World War II, many of the steel workers are drafted into service, but we still need people making steel so that we have our ships and our guns and our planes. And so we have this, um, you probably know the iconic image of Rosie the Riveter and we can do it. And that poster was really encouraging women to join the war effort, to take up these positions where before this time they weren't really welcome. And it was, um, it was really revolutionary. And so here we have this photograph. This is a woman who is drilling holes into an airplane wing, um, preparing them to be riveted together. So then we're gonna transition into our silk gallery. And while women were not working in the steel plant before World War II, they were still working in some factory positions. And one of those positions was in the textile mills. Um, textile mills were mostly women and children working, but there were men working some of, usually the higher level positions, actually. Let's take a look at this table here. So silk is unique from other textiles because unlike cotton and linen, which comes from plant fibers, or wool, which comes from animal fibers, silk actually comes from insects. Um, specifically the silk moth, more specifically the silkworm of the silk moth. Um, so silkworms um, feed on mulberry leaves. They're originally from Asia. And then when they're ready to turn into moths, they make their cocoon. And the cocoon is what is made of the silk fibers. And when the moth is ready to emerge, it eats its way out of the cocoon and then hatches. But eating its way out of the cocoon destroys the fibers. So in order to retain the silk, what they do is they harvest the cocoons and they actually boil them in hot water to kill the little worms inside. And then they unwind the silk fibers into these long strands and then spin them into threads. And here on the table, this, um, this is a skein of spun silk threads before it has been processed into a fabric. So we'll make our way around the gallery. We're gonna go over here. So this is a cutout of Mother Jones. And so I mentioned that in the silk mills, we have women and children working, and they're often working in dangerous conditions under um, long hours, often up to 12 hours a day. And sometimes the children were as young as seven or eight years old. Um, and they're working with machinery that has a lot of parts, fast moving. Um, if you get your finger caught in a thread, you could lose your finger. If a machine broke down, oftentimes they would have the children crawling underneath to repair them because the children were the ones that fit. Um, and if the machine started working while the child was under there, then the child would be horribly injured. Um, and so 
um, one of the other positions that we often saw young children doing was carrying these heavy bobbin trays. And these trays weighed about 20 pounds and they would carry them all day long, um, either helping to load up threads into the backs of looms or you see this rack of bobbins right here. Um, so they would be running around with these trays all day in these poor conditions, not making a lot of money, working long hours. And the kids wanted to go to school. So Mother Jones and these children started protesting um, for uh, child labor laws so that the kids could go to school because if they didn't go to school, they wouldn't get an education. And without an education, they, they would probably be stuck working different positions in the mills their whole lives. And they wanted to change the positions that they were in. They wanted to rise up out of poverty. And so they really fought to go to school. And so Mother Jones was one of these leading activists who really fought for the, the child labor laws to protect the kids from these dangerous and conditions and long hours. And in 1903, she actually led a march from Philadelphia all the way to New York City to President Roosevelt's house um, asking for an audience. And with her, she had women and children marching. Um, and when they got there, he, he refused to see them and they were turned away. But um, years later, laws were finally passed protecting children um, from these working conditions and allowing them to go to school instead. So then let's take a look at what happens to our silk to turn it into fabric. So I'm actually gonna zoom back a little bit. Oops, went too far. Okay. So we have our silk and it's spun into long threads. And then these threads are called skeins. Now on this machine, you can kind of see this red right here. That's a skein loaded onto this machine. And this skein would then be wound onto a bobbin, which would have been like here. I don't know if you can see that. Those are empty bobbins on the machine right now. These are the full, what the full bobbins would look like. So the bobbins would be taken from this machine and then loaded onto a rack like this one. Because in order to create woven fabric, we need a warp and a weft. The warp are the threads that are already on the loom. If you've ever done um, weaving in like an art class, then the, the warp threads are the ones that go up and down and the weft threads go side to side. Those are the ones that you put onto the loom. So to create the warp, we have all of our threads on this frame and they are wound around this large warping wheel which measures out how much warp we need and then it puts it onto a bar which would be in this area which is blocked and then the warp would be put on the back of our loom and threaded through. So before we have any sort of automated machinery to create intricate designs like the ones that you see up on this wall it would have had to have been done by hand with someone standing in front of the loom and picking up the threads that they needed um, to create the design. But then a man named Joseph Marie Jacquard came up with a way to automate the looms using punch cards. This is really early computer technology. This is the first time we see punch cards being used in this way. And the punch cards would go through this part of the machine and tell the loom which threads to raise and lower in order to get these intricate patterns. And in this way, we could get um, these beautiful decorative cloths um, without having to pay for the skilled laborers to spend a lot of time making these designs so they could actually sell the fabric cheaper and so more people could afford to purchase fancier looking fabrics. And then over here we have some machines that um, are making the punch cards that go into the loom. This is a pattern card which is on graph paper sort of design. And someone would be sitting at this bench, looking at this pattern and then punching the holes into the punch card. And then this machine can copy that punch card. So if your pattern replicates, you would put the card here, it could make a copy. So you could have five, 10, 20 of those cards without having to sit here and punch them individually. And then the cards would be brought over here to this machine and threaded together. And here's an example of two cards that have been threaded together. And then, once the cards are all threaded together, then they are put on the top of the loom 
and then you have your complete pattern. So we're running a little short on time here. So I'm just gonna take you through this last gallery real quick here. Um, in this gallery, we talk about propane. Um, in 1910, Walter Snelling discovered how to harness the power of propane. Walter Snelling was actually an explosive expert and he had a friend that purchased an automobile and he noticed that every time he put gas in it, some, by the time he got home, some of the gas appeared to be missing, like more than should be missing. So he asked Snelling if he could investigate. And what Snelling discovered is that gasoline is actually made up of a couple different components. And one of them was the gas propane and it was evaporating off of the gasoline. So with this propane, he then discovered a way to harness the power of propane and um, use it. And so right here, we have some of his original laboratory equipment, which is really neat to see. You see some test tubes. And then over here, that's a weird angle, okay. Um, So after he discovers how to harness the power of propane, he then has to sell it to people because no one knows what it is and people are often wary of something new. Um, a lot of people worry that it might be dangerous. So he creates these little kits that he would take door to door. They often had a small propane tank and a little lamp and he would demonstrate that the propane could power the lamp. And this was really revolutionary because during this time in history, you only really had access to electricity if you lived in a city. People who lived in rural areas out in the farmland would not have electric lights in their homes. But since propane could be transported in tanks, I'm about to show you over here, tanks like these could be transported all the way out to a farmhouse in the country. And so people far from the cities had access to electric lights now and they could power their stoves. And so it really changed the way these people lived. And then we still use propane today. So we have some modern day examples of propane and how it's transported. And then if you come to visit us, we have this cool little VR experience where you can hop in this hot air balloon and fly over a propane plant. Um, and so that is, the, that is the last gallery in the museum. So I guess we can take questions now. I'll stop sharing my screen. So I see, how long was Bethlehem Steel open for? So Bethlehem Steel was open, I believe, beginning in the 1860s. And then it closed in the, well, it, it progressively closed. The last cast was in 1995. And then the corporations um, officially disbanded in 2002. The early- Sorry uh, for doing that tour. I thought that um, you did a wonderful job. I think we had another question, um, one that was not included in this tour because it is just a recently acquired piece. And that is, uh, the question was, what is our oldest um, artifact that we have on display? And that is um, a acorn printing press that we recently acquired. I think it was back in January of just this year. And that is dated uh, circa 19, or sorry, 1835. Um, Emily, I don't know if you want to say a couple words about um, that interesting piece and, and the history that it went through um, at the Morning Call, uh, the local newspaper here in Allentown before uh, it wound up in, um, in our lobby. Yeah, at one point it had actually gone through a fire. And so we've been trying to figure out which components of the machine are actually original because um, printing presses are cast iron framed, but some of the components are wooden. So it's been kind of a, a history mystery trying to figure out um, how much of that machine is original or not.
Okay, we have another question. Um, what, what machine in your collection has had the biggest impact on industrial history? Um, this, you know, I wonder if some of this is somewhat a, a subjective question. Um, Emily, what's, I, I have my opinion. What, what, what would you say for this? Um, that's a hard question. Um, I'm gonna go with the steam engine, um, just because in early industrial history, um, steam power really changed the way that we were able to work and manufacture things. You start to see mass production happening. Um, and as we started out the tour in the lobby, like the Frick Eclipse portable steam engine, portable power was really revolutionary. So I'm gonna say steam engines. <laughs> I would agree, actually, and uh, that is one of my favorite pieces. I've got three favorite pieces, but the uh, the, the portable steam engine in our lobby is, is definitely one of them, and that is one of the reasons why I think it, it did have, in my opinion, the biggest impact in industrial history, and I think um, the, uh, the visual that we have that you pointed out, Emily, with the bushel baskets uh, is, is a perfect um, example of the difference between using man-made power and steam engine. Uh, another question that we had from a, a Facebook viewer is, who is a person featured at our site that impacts our daily lives, but often isn't shared? Like an inventor, I'm guessing? Yeah. Um, They mean an inventor. I think I'm going to go with Henry Gray and the Gray Mill, actually. Um, because, I mean, before being at this museum, I had never heard of him. Um, but his invention, his innovation, actually changed the way that we could construct buildings, um, which, I mean, that changes the whole landscape of cities and skylines. Um, so, yeah, Henry Gray. I like that answer. I also did not know what the Gray Mill was. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, when I first came here, everybody was talking about the Gray Mill and they wanted to, uh, we have a program called Adopt an Artifact. Everybody wanted to adopt the Gray Mill. Uh, now it makes sense. Um, any other questions? Oh, uh, one more is how did we record the 3D tour? Uh, we were actually fortunate. Um, we, during the pandemic, we had a grant that was supposed to go towards some traditional advertising. Um, and because we had to delay a lot of our programs and events, uh, the, the money towards that advertising wasn't going to be used. So the, um, the grant tour had allowed us to repurpose that money for um, this 3D tour. So um, we had reached out to an individual that was able to come in with um, some high-tech uh, camera equipment and um, they, I mean, it just took a, a matter of hours, I think, right, Emily? Um, took images of the museum and, um, and I thought they did a great job. And okay, we have a couple more that came in. Um, What question do students ask most when they visit? Hmm. I think the typical question we get is how, when did Bethlehem Steel close? It's like the, they're, they're really curious about that. I think because of a lot of the kids that visit us are from the area. And so they have family that worked in the plant or um, they just, it's part, of, it's a big part of the community. Um, so a lot of curiosity around Bethlehem Steel. It's true. Uh, what's a little known secret about the National Museum of Industrial History uh, or one of the displays? Ooh. A little known secret. Well, I know that um, some of our staff thinks that there's ghosts in the museum <laughs> <laughs> because our building, uh, you know, the, our building itself is an artifact um, since it was a former Bethlehem Steel artifact. Um, Oh, I have a good one. Um, so one of the lathes that is in Machinery Hall was actually in 
I think the third Transformers movie. So oh. it's um it's a movie star. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there parts of the museum we weren't able to see today that we could see in person if we visit? That was all of the inside galleries for now. Um, in the future, we do hope to expand to the second floor, but this year we will be opening our outdoor park, um, which features more of our larger steel related machinery. And then um, we'll also have area to do more outdoor demonstrations. Yes, and that's an exciting area, um, Emily, because as you said, with the outdoor demonstrations, but we have a lot of um, operating machinery out there, one of uh, which is our locomotive, um, where we're able to have educational experiences on it, um, where you can actually ride with an engineer and learn how it operates. And, um, and it, it used to actually run on narrow gauge railroad at the Bethlehem Steel Plant. So very exciting things happening in our park. And it looks like uh, just one last question, which was um, when the museum started, we actually, um, we have a very rich history in that uh, we were incorporated back in 19, or sorry, yeah, um, 1997 as a museum. Um, and it, it, it was uh, conceived of an, as an idea back when Bethlehem Steel was going out of business. Um, and it, it was something that we attribute to um, the uh, some of the executives at Corp, uh, at Bethlehem Steel Corporation, and I think that they did an excellent job of making sure that they didn't just uh, kind of build fences and walk away from the site. They really wanted to make sure that they left the area, um, you know, with a good um, opportunity for the community and. Um, so with that, they had donated the building to the museum, made sure that there was a um, good opportunity for economic development going forward. Um, it did take a little while for us to raise the funds. There was you know, economic changes that were going on over the times. Uh, the museum went through different iterations of what it was gonna look like. Ultimately, we opened our doors in 19, or sorry, in 2016, August 2016. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite an inter interesting past and we're actually thinking about documenting what that past looked like as well. So, And I just want to say thank you so much to uh, the National History Academy and Brent Glass. Thank you, um, you know, on behalf of uh, the board and the, and the staff, National Museum of Industrial History for giving us this opportunity. And um, Emily, wonderful tour again, thank you. And Karen, Emily, thank you so much for being with us today. This is really great to be a part of. And thank you all for joining us. And please, uh, we'll be here again next week, same time with the tour of the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum.